morning, everyone, and welcome back at our conference. It is a great honor and my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Dori Laub. He is a medical doctor and practicing psychoanalyst in New Haven, Connecticut, who works primarily with victims of massive psychic trauma and, their, and with their children. Furthermore, he is clinical professor of psychiatry at the Yale University of Medicine and co-founder of the Fortune of Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. Born in Czernowitz in 1937, which at that time belonged to Romania, today to Ukraine, he is himself a Holocaust survivor. He was acting director of the Genocide Study Program at Yale University in 2000 and 2003. Since 2001, he has served as deputy director for trauma studies for this program. Dori Laub has published on the topic of psychic trauma, on its knowing, its representation, in a variety of psychoanalytic journals. And he has co-authored a very important volume that we also discussed in class, Testimony, Crisis of Witnessing in Literature, Psychoanalysis and History. 1992. Currently, he is editing a new book on social trauma, psychoanalysis and uh, testimony together with Andreas Hamburger. I look very much forward to this lecture today, which is entitled Listening to my mother's testimony. The floor is yours. <coughs> thank you, Claudia. And thank you again for inviting me and giving the, me the opportunity to be here. And it's very exciting. What my presentation today is about uh, is a history. Um, I was in the Chernovitz, a town in the northeast of Romania, deported with my parents in 42 for two years to Transnistria, an area uh, Ukraine occupied by Romania in which the, where the camps were created. Um, after that, uh, returned back. My father perished in the camps. And uh, my own mother gave her testimony in 1986. I had not touched that testimony for 26 years. And this paper is on viewing her testimony and reflecting, both as a survivor, as somebody who remembered events that she described herself, and I lived through too, and as an analyst reflects on what he hears and what the responses he has in himself. <clears throat> as I listen to my mother's testimony, I'm struck by the first words she utters. This hurts so much, the stood so vague. I feel very shaken. I f can feel her pain shooting through me. This is a glimpse, a flashback <coughs> of how she experiences herself, of how she feels looking at her life. It is the moment she is most open with herself and with me. Several times during the testimony, when I urge her to describe the pictures she has seen on the screen of her memory, she simply refuses and proceeds to talk about events as facts. Quote, I do not want to, I never think about this. It is indescribable. Jews from all over the city trying to reach the ghetto is ordered that very day at 6 p.m., the curfew time. They are carrying their belongings, their bedding strapped around their neck. Some are not making it. They remain lying in the street. Close quotes. She quickly reined in her pain and began discussing with me the mechanics of the interview. Should she wear glasses, look at me, etc. I, she, but she loosened up considerably when I invited her to speak about her, quote, sunny childhood memories in the little village of Banila, now in the Ukraine. She had the biggest red apple, the nicest dress, for the Jewish holiday of Simchat Torah. Her parents' home was the center of intellectual Jewish Zionist life in town. Investors would join the evening meal for passionate discussions. <coughs> there was a special room with a Sefer Torah, where on, very on Shabbat and holiday services were regularly held. 
she always attended the prayer. One cannot help but be impressed by the self-awareness, intense participation of the little girl in the life she lived. She was on par with the grown-ups, yet cherished very much the, the privileged child position. On viewing the tape, I wonder whether my mother needed to remember her early childhood as so sunny because of what followed. At age six, the whole family had to flee to the advancing Russian troops who brutalized the village <coughs> during an earlier occupation. It was World War I. The whole family wandered on foot through Eastern and Central Europe until they reached the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia <coughs> that had large Jewish graveyards, but only a few living Jews because of earlier pogroms. The family settled there for nearly two, two years. When they returned to their hometown, Vanilla, they found that their home had been destroyed. My mother gave a testimony to the Fortune Video Archive on November 8, 1986. Larry Langer and I were her interviewers because she wanted to speak in German. I first viewed her testimony in November 12, 2012, 26 years later. I have not only revisited my mother's story of survival, which is also my own, but I've also revisited my own work as an interviewer of Holocaust survivors and as a psychoanalyst. The following events, which she describes in her testimony, and which I remember in detail, illustrate my mother's unique ability to fully grasp the danger inherent in a particular situation and make a split-second decision that saved our lives. <coughs> it was the day in which our camp, the Carriera de Piatra, Romanian for stone quarry, was to be liquidated. German SS arrived in trucks in order to transport the nearly 2,000 inmates across the river Book, which was the several hundred yards away, to the German-occupied portion of the Ukraine, where Einsatzgruppen, death squads, they operated, and where they faced certain death. During the preceding week, an attorney by the name of Stoller collected money in order to bribe the camp commandant, the Romanian, to protect the group of Jews. A list was compiled of people who he would claim were essential for the upkeep of the camp and where they were protected from being taken by the Germans. After nearly a, sleepless, a nearly sleepless night, all the camp inmates were arranged at dawn in groups of 30 on the big central square. My father was the leader of such group. As Tony Stoller and his family was part of our group, was standing nearby, and my mother was watching them closely. Suddenly, he, the Stoller picked up his luggage, starting to move away with his family. My mother took me by, by my hand, I was five, and did the same, summoning with my father to join. Stoller challenged her, insisting that only he was being called, to which she responded that she was being called too. My father reluctantly joined us as he couldn't abandon the group he was in charge of. We, uh, after walking for several hundred yards with Romanian and German soldiers milling around and not stopping us, we arrived at the wooden hut where the Jews who were on the list were hiding. The door was locked from inside, and my mother banged on it. According to her testimony, she was asked whether she was on the list, and when she is responded with yes, she was allowed in. I remember the hut being packed full with people, standing very quietly. We could hear a lot of commotion outside, cars driving, people screaming. Hours passed. Suddenly I heard a <coughs> German shout, Jews out! My father started to say goodbye to my mother, embraced her, and gave her a Swiss watch, something to sell. Somehow the commandant of the, sea of the camp was notified, appeared on the scene, and insisted that these were his Jews. The Germans relented and left. More hours passed. As the evening set in, things quieted down. The door was opened, and we were allowed to leave and to return to our barracks. The place was completely deserted, and it was a clear night. We could see the stars in the sky and hear the echoes of our footsteps. I turned to my father and asked him how deep the sky was. 
He understood my question, which really was, how far away was God? He answered, to me, his answer was, Roosevelt and Churchill are not going to let this happen. Nothing else needs to be said. Now, something about my mother's positions. Being in the lead. As long as my mother's, tes as my mother's testimony relates to events that preceded my own conscious memories, I could listen to it as to any other testimony. The moment she started talking of events of which I had my own clear conscious memories, my listening changed. These were now like composite memories I was hearing, constructed from her memories and from my own. I could no longer imagine what I heard because I dreamed it myself. My own, mem my own memories felt to me to be more immediate, more specific, and I often filled the gaps in her testimony. There was something very assuring for me in experiencing that convergence of memories, hers and mine. I was not alone with my memories, but in fact, I had never been alone with my memories. I experienced my mother's, my mother as always present, as always she was in charge and in the lead, and things were going to turn out all right the way she promised. She assumed that role of being in the lead shortly after World War II started. Both her parents were sick, her child was little, and her husband was at risk because men were more easily targeted. All the family wealth had been stripped away by the Soviets, who had briefly occupied Chernobyl, the town we lived in, in 1940. She found herself to be in the lead in the daily struggle for survival and felt she had to do that alone and on her own. She could not share her terror, her worries, her unrelenting search for nearly impossible solutions to life-threatening situations with her family members. She had to appear steadfast and self-assured so as to keep her, their spirit up, to keep them from surrendering to faith, even when she felt that the ground under her feet was giving way. Moreover, the rules of engagement had drastically changed. Benevolence, tolerance, and solidarity were all but gone. One could no longer rely on having their status and the rights of a citizen, a refugee, or even a human being whose life is guaranteed. No promises and no agreements were kept. The perpetrator could carry out at will acts of reckless violence and of brutality. There was no limit. Killings, beatings, robbings were on the order of the day. Merciless, whimsical, and even ever-changing edicts were as random as were bullets. The Ukrainian bystanders, yesterday's neighbor, partook in the atrocities. And the fellow Jewish victims ruthlessly competed for the scarce chances for survival. My mother had to learn and master the unprecedented new landscape and often had to do so in a split second, incessantly, and while on the run. She had to constantly be on the alert and forcefully suppress her yearning to return to normalcy, to the way things were. She could do so as long as my father was on her side. The motto was, it was war, and the war will be over one day. All one had to ensure was surviving the war. When my father was no longer on her side, she shriveled. He'd been taken away on a raid during the Armenian camp by Romanian authorities. She continued to ferociously protect her child, but no longer had hope. Deep down, she realized that her normalcy will never be there again. She stopped hoping for a return of the life she once, uh, she once had. Even though when she came back, we came back from the camp home, to our surprise, her parents were still alive. There was no communication over two years. Uh, instead of return to normalcy, what appeared was her yearning to be again a child, the child she remembered. It was as though the regressive pull that had been so tightly suppressed during the fight for survival could be allowed back into consciousness. As her son, I found it difficult to empathically respond to this wish to be, to be a child again. It either threatened my position as the child in the diet, or 
I found it unsafe and premature because both as a survivor myself and as a child, it was, I was far from certain that the war had at least ended. Now, it was about a year after we returned from the camp that my mother took ill and was bedridden for over six months. Many doctors examined her and there were multiple diagnoses. Some thought it was her heart, other called it rheumatism. In retrospect, I think it was a depression with many somatic symptoms. She had at least one bout of anger for no apparent reasons, during which she screamed and beat me. After years of restraint, she finally gave way, gave in to the suppressed pent-up rage for what was done to her and to the pain for the losses she had suffered. I couldn't forgive her for that for about 10 years until my maternal grandmother died in 1956. I hardly spoke to my mother. After my grandmother mother died, I realized that it was only she and I now, and we were both alone. I made my peace with her and told her about my long silence without giving the reason for it. As the testimony unfolded, I realized the centrality of my position in my mother's life, in her survival and in her memory. Her story, her story is frequently interspersed with dialogues and arguments she had with her little boy. In terms of our relationship is how she remembered and how she narrated to herself the story of the camp. I more and more came to realize that this is a testimony of a mother about a child and the presence of her child, a survivor himself, who at the same time is also the interviewer, the receiver of the testimony. Some methodological uh, considerations. There's a portion of memories which are really before my birth, and I know a little about the family was quite wealthy, high standard of living, it was a good life, but there were uh, clouds gathering on the horizon uh, uh, regarding a, the war that was coming. The years uh, of anti-Semitic persecution uh, before camps is something I vaguely remember. I remember the Soviet occupation and the terror. Uh, I remember the ghetto experience very vaguely. Curiously, my own memories, separate from my mother's, come from the time we spent in the camps. An example of such memories are my sitting with a little girl on the banks of the river Bug, that was the dividing line between Romanian and German occupied Ukraine, and we were arguing whether you can eat grass or you cannot. I said you cannot eat grass. Obviously, in the background, there's hunger here. Uh, another memory of this face was sitting near a window and looking out, which was on the dirt road to the front. And incessantly, there were troops, ambulances, armored vehicles moving towards the front line, both Romanian and German. And at one particular day, the movement went into the other direction. There was a retreat. And shortly, within a week or two, Soviet uh, so, uh, troops arrived and they were liberated. Uh, there are multiple perspectives side by side in my mother's testimony of and about her five-year-old son. First is the boy whom, at whom she talk, of whom she talks. He is depicted as precociously aware of the grim situation of unfolding events. He knows that the uniformed men that came one afternoon by surprise came to take us to the camps. And he refuses to stay home with the grandparents and, has, and says, where my parents go, I go. But my mother and dad, that's where I go. He refuses to the family conversion to Christianity that might protect them. And he insists on wearing the yellow star, although children are exempt from wearing it, and all of that because he's a proud Jew. 
She also speaks about the child before it all started. And it said that he had the best of all. His clothes were imported from the United Kingdom. His uh, uh, toys were electric trains, the last that, uh, the technology you could get. What she doesn't mention is that he had a governess, a nanny, who was Aryan. And uh, that's how German came to be his first language. And uh, between the age of one through, and she was very close to my mother and uh, had to be repatriated against her wish back to Germany when the, I was three years old. Later on, when I took testimonies, I came to know that these German citizens repatriated never reached Germany. They were all shot on the way because they had seen too much of the Soviet presence and could be risky. When, is, when my mother speaks about my early childhood, it's with the same glow that she speaks of her own. This glow most likely became the central building block of the resilience she was able to mobilize during the hardships of our deportation. Now, in other, it, it's not only the child and her words and in my memories, it's so involved is also an adult here who has his own very explicit and vivid memories of events and, um, and often remembers details that his mother does not remember. And he adds it to the narrative, expands on it, and the most striking memory from those years in the camp is the wish to run away from my parents and to hide because I was so little nobody would find me. A, a third presence, the little boy, the grown-up, is the interviewer to the testimony who listens both to his mother's and to his own memories and uses them to bring her back to the narrative thread that she frequently loses, offers details. Uh, mentions the events that she has omitted. He thus functions as an orienting, guiding map, as well as a propelling force to his mother's narrative. The interviewer listens to himself to, uh, to his memories that come back and are very intense and vivid, and to his mother's testimony. And these are three complementary channels that inform him how to conduct the interview. And then the other presence is that of the psychoanalyst who has reflected of his mother's life uh, and what role she played in his becoming who he was as a child, adolescent, as a grown up. And with all that in mind, he picks up multiple cues multiple channels and from his mother and from himself and especially yes, we mentioned that yesterday on reviewing and reviewing the testimony again at least 12 times he allows this to reverberate himself on the f until they fall in place and are integrated into a fresh coherent insight uh, putting the information together On viewing the testimony multiple times, he listens both to what the witness's mother tells and how he responds to it now. Close attention to early viewings and to subsequent views and what changed in those. He reflects about her life, his life with her, and in the reflective space created here in which, is, in which the various perspectives coalesce and con can complement each other and can eventually become a multifaceted whole. I think when you see the excerpt, you'll understand better what I mean by that. <coughs> now, <coughs> what do I, do I glean about her and her self-perception? 
the self-protected child inside, inside. In my mother's testimony, it is as though physical reality matters little as long as human ties are preserved. Bitter cold, severe hunger, typhus, other life-threatening illnesses, as well as bullets that could hit in any moment matter little as long as the child has the protective space provided by his own parents when this occurs. And, and when this happens, there can even, there's even the possibility for optimism and laughter. When I speak about the protected child, I mean the child, me, and I also mean the protected child in her. I think this protected space that she carried within herself was the source of her resilience, initiative, and immense courage that she displayed time and again during the two years spent in the camps. She knew very well what the reality was. Uh, out of 6,000 persons who were deported on June 7, 14, and 28 from channels to the camps, merely 170 remained alive. But her suffering does not come through in her testimony. Her primary and most coveted wish was to protect her child from experiencing the harsh reality. She carried her sunny childhood inside herself. It was perhaps her most cherished possession, made into an impenetrable enclosure that was wrapped around her son. She spared no efforts to make the safety zone his own. She literally forced, fed him when she herself remained uh, hungry. She would put uh, food in my mouth and then say, cow, schluck, let's bite it and uh, or and, and uh, swallow it because I would not, I would leave the food in the mouth and not do anything. He was the apple of her eye, and she wanted to preserve his carefree childhood world, modeled on her memories, her own childhood, at all costs. She put everything she had into her, trying not only to provide for him but also to create for him opportunities to explore and find pleasure in life. Years later. When he was a university student, she sent him on trips throughout Europe when she herself was uncertain where the next meal would come from. Interestingly, she succeeded in her endeavor to instill the sense of safety in me. When I wanted and even tried once to run away from my parents, I did not doubt for a moment that I would be able to successfully hide and survive the war and have a life as beautiful as the one that she described she had. An example of this protectiveness follows. Now it's the first tape. Can you hear? And so we were eingestiegen in a Viehwagon. Midden, manche haben große Pakete gehabt, manche kleinere. Wir haben die wenigsten gehabt, weil wir keine Zeit hatten zu packen. Und es war ein schreckliches Gedränge. Es war nicht, wo zu sitzen, wo zu stehen. Mein Kind hat gleich begonnen, Mutika, wo ist mein Bettel, wo werde ich schlafen? Und da sagte ich ihm, um zu beruhigen, ich habe gesehen, wir waren, es waren sehr viele Intellektuelle, habe ich gedacht, ein Arzt wird die Rücksicht nehmen, hat er sich heraufgelegt auf meinem Kind. Herr Doktor, Herr Doktor, lassen Sie mich, das Kind kann ja nicht atmen. Man war sehr rücksichtslos, weil kein Platz vorhanden war. So hat man vollgestoppt, wie viel man hat können. Und mein Kind hat begonnen zu weinen, wo, wo werde ich schlafen, wo ist mein Bettel? Sag ich, Dori, ich werde dir ein anderes Bettel kaufen. Sagt er, du hast aber kein Geld, Mutti, woher wirst du nehmen, Geld mir zu kaufen, mein Bett? So, dass ich auch damit ihn nicht beruhigen konnte. Er hat geweint. Und wir sind weitergefahren. Das hat also gedauert. Ich weiß nicht, was du mir geantwortet hast. Was ich dir geantwortet habe? Dass ich dir kaufen werde im Bettel. Wieso? Ich werde das verkaufen. Du wirst du hast zwei Mäntel und wirst einen Mantel verkaufen und mir ein Bett kaufen. Ja, habe ich ihm geantwortet. 
nachdem er mir gesagt hat, dass, er keine, kein, dass ich kein Geld habe, ihm ein Bett zu kaufen, habe ich gesagt, ich habe zwei Mäntel, ich werde einen Mantel verkaufen und ihm kaufe mein Bett. The next uh, attribute is dealing with terror. When it comes to the terror of everyday life, facing death at every turn, my mother becomes either matter of fact, treating the experience as fact, speaking without affect in a blunted, constricted, almost robotic manner, or simply refuses to think or speak about events. Little horror comes through as she speaks of people being shot on her left and on her right. Oh. Um, or when she uh, talks about her escape from the deportation camp, when the, all the other inmates were transferred to the German side of the book. The same is true for other moments. She summons her, all her courage and decides of the acts. The terror of the situation she describes comes only through indirectly, through losing her uh, thread of thought or forgetting to speak about terrifying events. I know, I know about it and I um, try to direct her to. I'm in the unique position of knowing many of the events because I've lived them myself uh, and because of my internal witnessing, created and maintained vivid and detailed memories of those events. As an interviewer, I could thereby offer a safe, reliable holding environment for the traumatically broken memories my mother provided. Sometimes I could offer details to statements she made as illustrated in the earlier video except shown. What I experienced on my, uh, in my earlier viewing of the testimony as blunted affect or keeping a distance and later on wondered about dissociative elements came back to look on further introspection as something much more profound. profound. My mother was less there to go her story to herself while describing the critical moments such as finding the door to the hat where the camp's inmates were hiding while the rest were being deported to the book to be locked from inside. The most poignant term for the state I find in Giorgio Agamben's notion of the lacuna, which were yesterday mentioned, which are the core of every attempt, attempt at telling the Holocaust experience. Her vitality, her color, her strength had been drained from her narrative. <clears throat> I was surprised at my remembering those moments as the clearest. I most likely complimented the affective lacuna in her experience and in her memory through my experiencing and through my memories and through my imagination. In her testimony, I literally brought her back to those moments. The excerpt that follows exemplifies such a situation. I literally had to remind her of the episode that follows. Sind wir alle drei gegangen und der Offizier hat schon das Geld gehabt und konnte uns nicht loswerden. Wohin soll er uns führen? Er hat ja nicht wohin. Hat er begonnen, Menschen zu schießen? Der geht nicht in Reihe und glied. Hier hat man laut gesprochen. Da hat man, ich weiß, zu, zu viel. Er hat immer etwas gesucht und die Leute geschaut. Auf einmal zielt er mit dem Gewehr. Ich habe nicht gewusst. Zielt er auf meinen Sohn oder auf meinen Mann? Zu uns war es gerichtet, aber nicht auf meine Person. Da habe ich Angst. Und es waren drei, vier Soldaten, die uns geführt haben. Wie sagt, äh, so wie er die Waffe zielt, wieder zu schießen, habe ich mich gestürzt. Ich habe nicht gedacht, in dem Bruch der einer Sekunde, was ich mache. Habe ich mich gestürzt auf die Waffe, damit er mich erschießt und nicht meinen Mann oder mein Kind. Ist der Papleck stehen geblieben? Das ist ihm noch nicht vorgekommen. Juden sollen revoltieren. Die müssen wie Schafe gehen. 
Und während äh, ich mich gestürzt habe, sage ich immer auf Rumänisch, mein Herr, jetzt ist Krieg. Auch du hast Familie. Du bist nicht sicher, ob du deine Familie wiedersehen wirst. Kannst mehr Mitleid aufbringen mit diesen unglücklichen Menschen. Er hat es ganz gut vernommen. Das Ganze war vielleicht eine Minute. Und ich habe nicht nachgedacht vorher, was ich tue und was ich sage. Statt mich zu erschießen, war er so benommen und durcheinander. hat Angst gehabt, die anderen werden auch revoltieren. Man wird ihm täten, dass er herausgenommen hat eine Ledergärte. Und hat mich begonnen zu schlagen über dem Kopf. Die ersten zwei Schläge habe ich gespürt, aber die restlichen nicht mehr. Ich bin zusammengebrochen und ich bin Wochen gelegen. Wahrscheinlich war es eine Gehirnhautentzündung mit Temperatur, bewusstlos. Aber mein Mann hat noch gelebt, hat er mir noch keinen etwas reichen. I have no memory of what followed her being beaten unconscious. I was unable to imagine and remember that my mother was gone and that I was left alone without a protection. In this, as well as in other episodes, I do, did, however, remember details that markedly varied from the ones that she related in her testimony. I knew that the gun was not pointed at me, but only at my father. My father and I were not even standing close by together. I knew that the woman behind the locked door in the hut where people were hiding did not politely ask my mother whether she was on the list and when she, my mother said yes, open the door. I remembered my mother banging on the door and threatening that they did, if they did not open it, she would turn all the occupants over to the Germans. Is it possible that I sent that at such moments she had reached the limits of her endurance and therefore I took over the function of observing and judging events so that I would be able to act? That I created my own stable boundaries when I sensed that the protective space she continuously offered was wearing thin? I find this to be a par excellence example for the intergenerational transmission of trauma in the making. I knew exactly how great a terror, the terror that lurked behind her courageous behavior was because I had been there myself. I had learned from a strategy that worked to observe in detail, to reflect, and to be able to act. I employed it myself at moments when I felt that she could no longer handle it. There, that's how my memories of such moments came to be so precocious, vivid, and detailed. Yet I was always absolutely certain that she would come back. Alone and by myself, I could not carry this on. She would always be there and guarantee life and guarantee the future. I wondered, by the same token, whether it was I who had become the repos repository of the feelings of terror my mother refused so that she could continue acting with courage. On counter-transference analysis, examining my own responses to my mother's testimony, I noticed remarks that she made which triggered feelings of resentment in me. This was particularly so when she spoke of the biggest disappointment of her life which was how vicious people, and by that she meant fellow Jews, could be towards each other. She felt betrayed by her former friends who turned their backs on her when she tried to tell them of her sufferings in the camps. I also felt resentment when she spoke of still wanting to be the child she once was. It was difficult for me to hear her plea for being cared for and for being parented. I was angered by presenting herself as the victim. To me, she had always been the lioness mother, and I did not release her for, want to release her from that position, that is, to lose her. Moreover, I refused to offer the mothering she pleaded for, and th that is to make it a two-way street between the two of us. All my adult life, I repeatedly watched her getting hurt getting turned down by friends and relatives who refused to reciprocate her offers to share. 
I always tried to alert her, to warn her, to be more discriminated as to whom she engaged with. I always tried to protect her from pain and sometimes even fought her battles. Yet I, I hated doing that, resented being invited to be her parent. I had no difficulties doing that, that very same thing for others, to make it a core of my identity as a healer, as an analyst, I could accompany my patients into the hardest, most terrifying places. I could be totally present and regular at their pace so they would continue moving, not fall or break apart. With my mother, I refused to engage her pain. Did she not know better? Was she not the extraordinarily courageous, fearless woman who banged on the locked door and leaped at the gun that was aimed at my father? I remember that later in life, I felt so abandoned and so enraged by her readiness to give in to her pain. I felt it to be such betrayal, and I wanted nothing to do with it. I realized that examining my contratrance's feelings after my earlier viewings helped me listen better to subsequent viewings of the testimony. I therefore decided to resume scanning comments, as you made, that irritated me. I found myself bursting at her repeatedly expressing a belief that events hit her harder, wounded her more deeply because she was so completely unprepared for them. She had been raised as the most special, beloved, indulged child and daughter by her protective parents and grandparents. She had led the most sheltered life and therefore the abyss she fell into was so much steeper. Was she not a refugee in World War I between age six and eight? Did she not lose an older sister to diphtheria during that exile? Did she not find her home had been destroyed when she came back? Was that presumed innocence and naivete the very reason for exposing herself to being repeatedly hurt throughout her life? I found her claim to shelteredness to be the breeding ground for the ultimate disappointment later in life. For me, it also detracted from the truthfulness and authenticity of the horror she lived through. I felt that it to be a self-indulgent privatization of her pain. I realized that indeed with the onset of the war, in particular with the deportation of the camps, there was a pervasive drop in status in my mother's life. Her whole world came crashing down. She plummeted from being a wealthy, sheltered wife and daughter whose major task was to be beautiful, elegant, sociable, and entertaining, to a woman, and eventually a widow, who was no longer wealthy had, and had no means to support herself and her family. She had no one to lean on except her husband, who believed that the world, the world could be safeguarded by hard work and by following orders. She was encumbered by two ailing parents she had to take care of and by a five-year-old boy for whom she struggled to bring normalcy back. I realized all that, but I felt that that alone did not warrant her surrender to her pain. This was particularly so because she had already demonstrated how ferociously she could fight back. Further reflections on counter-transference analysis. I'm trying to continue writing about my mother's testimony and find myself staring at a blank space, unable to come up with a new thought, feelings of boredom alternate with the sensation that I'm facing a solid concrete wall. Is there anything more, anything new that I have to say? Doesn't the vast literature already exist on the transgenerational transmission of trauma? What, if anything, can I add to it? Yet I feel that something is in abeyance, waiting, wrapped in terror. What I'm facing when I try to move is a solid and penetrable barrier. I do not possess the strength to inch myself forward. Then it strikes me as if I've peeped behind the curtains. I just, I just read something I'd written about testimony more than two decades before about the, quote, testimonial camaraderie allows for the shared realization that the lost ones are not coming back. The realization that what life is all about is precisely to loop in an unfulfilled promise, an unfulfilled hope. 
no context exists that demonstrates this more powerfully than surviving the Holocaust. I feel that my mother's life is the very testimony to exactly that. I understand now her opening comment. This hurts so much, the stood of him. The damage my mother suffered and lived through had never been repaired. She did not find a soulmate with whom she could rebuild her life. She did not remarry, have more children, and reinvent her life. The losses she sustained remained losses to the very end. She learned to value close family ties and therefore nurtured both her parents until she died. She put everything she had into me, her only child. When her financial situation was stabilized and her son married and had children, she still didn't have a home, a family. He left for a distant continent, taking her first grandchild, which she doted so on away from her. The grandchildren she had did not compensate for her losses. She had a feather stuffed quilt sewn for him so that he could feel warm in the cold wintry nights far away. I knew of her anguish and did whatever I could to lessen it. I was cognizant of her pain, of her unending mourning for her own blissful childhood, for the time in life when she still had a close companion, my father. No deprivation was too much then. No effort seemed too hard for her at that time. I realized that nothing I could do could reverse the destruction, make her life whole again. I realized that the Holocaust is a wound that does not heal. I had to face my own limitations, my own failure to fulfill the grandiose expectations I had to be able to heal her pain. The best I could do was to face together with her this, the destruction which allowed for no genuine hope, for no light at the end of the tunnel. tunnel. I, her unalleviated uh, pain, however, placed a big burden on me, which I often resented. In the last video excerpt I am going to show, I challenged the illusory frozen imbalance between her experience and mine. Her having lost everything and my having retained my wholesomeness, regained, refound what I cared for most. Such imbalance could potentially undermine my ability to witness her test testimony. I bin hereinkommen in die Wohnung. Eigentlich sollte ich glücklich sein, weil ich vom Lager komme. Aber es war solch ein Armut, dass ich da keine Vorhänge, keine Teppiche, keine gar nichts, gar nicht so arm, so trocken. Mein Sohn als erstes ist gelaufen, er hat in Erinnerung gehabt, dass er hat einen speziellen Schrank und dort sind seine Spielsachen. Als erstes ist er gelaufen zu seinem Schrank. Richtig, meine Eltern haben von diesen Sachen nichts verkauft, er hat elektrische Ziege. Er hat damals gehabt schon diese Spielsachen, die man heute sieht, die technischen. Und alles war am Platz und der hat sich riesig gefreut. Und mein Vater ist zu ihm zugegangen, ganz leise, ich soll nicht hören. Dorile, hast du eine Laus gesehen? Du erinnerst dich? Sagt er, was heißt das, Opa, was heißt das? Weil ich ihn wirklich reinge nach Möglichkeit reingehalten habe. Ja, aber ich erinnere mich an den Spielschrank. Es war ein grau-bläulicher Schrank, glaube ich. Ich habe sehr und es waren fast keine Spielzeuge. Es waren genug, vielleicht nicht alle. Und ich habe ja, der Schrank hat mir leer ausgeschaut. Dann hast du recht. Sie sagen leer und die Mutter sagt voll. Es waren Spiel einige Spielzeuge, aber es waren nicht, nicht alle. Das Excerpt ist of such importance because it demonstrates how the totality of the destruction she experiences is addressed both by her and by me. Although, to her surprise, she finds both her parents alive. Everything feels so hopeless, so bleak. <coughs> she tries to balance the sense of doom with the illusion of my refining all my toys intact, my contradiction, 
not only deprives her of her illusion, but also informs her in a voice that is completely separate and my own, that already at that time I had stopped being the child that had to be kept happy. On the contrary, I had been and continue to be fully present and informed of the irreversible destructiveness we both experienced. She seemed to have been relieved by my contradicting her and promptly informed me, me by, that, by saying, then you are right. Concluding remarks. As earlier mentioned, the multiple viewings of my mother's testimony created and maintained an enhanced reflective space which allowed the overwhelming identification with the experience she relates and any grief and pain and the unfulfillable wishes she expressed to become more and more contextualized. The survivor, the son, and the listener to the testimony feels less and less overwhelmed, helpless, and enraged, and paralyzed, and can empathically hear and accept the enormity of the pain that she feels, the rage she suppresses, in the unrelenting terror she does not and cannot let herself feel and does not let herself know of. Listening to the contextualized identification with her plight allows for a feeling of authentic empathy to emerge that no longer are fro is frozen, a, a frozen reflexive respond. Movement and imagination as well as language and narrative become possible, allowing for traumatizing affect to persist as signal affect that's preventing it from colonizing completely the space available for experience, in essence, from hijacking life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dari. Very striking contrast between um, the testimony we saw yesterday, um, where these two women, mother and daughter, seem to seem to have a sort of breakdown and cry, and see in contrast the whole spa of your mother and her energy and courage. But then what you what you also said uh, in your talk is all we have not seen in the video testimony. Um, the enormity of her pain, her depression, um, her need for herself being mothered, mm -hmm. um, and uh, losses that will never be repaired. So there seems to be... We, we, we discussed yesterday in the potential of video testimonies and the special to written testimonies. Um, and today, when listening to your mother's testimony and your interpretation of her testimony, I wonder whether we need even more something which also transcends the video testimony, someone who knows the everyday life context and um, has corrective memories, especially when there's a dissonance between your own memories and her memories. A certain alliance is formed during the video testimony that lasts. And um, it's a presence that the survivor keeps inside as a companion. You know, we re interviewed eight survivors, uh, I would say like 20 years after the first interview. <coughs> now, I uh, my own defensiveness, I even forgot two of them. I forgot the first interview and I saw that it was, I watched the tape and everyone was back. But when we started the 20 year later interview, it was as if we picked up the thread. It was as if it was yesterday, which for me was an indication that they had continued the dialogue. In the, in the intervening 20 years. Uh, <coughs> just picked up and as you remember, I told you, and so obviously the, the uh, or it's not been 
uh, proven by a methodology, by sound research methodology, but that dialogue continues for many. And that presence continues of the, uh, uh, for many and has uh, uh, alleviating impact on their pain. They're not alone with the loss. They've spoken to it and they are already spoken memories. And, and a spoken memory has a, a partner to dialogue. So that inside is established. Before that, it was an unspoken memory. It was no par partner to dialogue. Other questions from the audience? How do I hear corrective memory? Uh, corrective memory is not one that brings it closer to the truth necessarily. It's a corrective to an emotional wound, which means solitary memory becomes shared memory. That's uh, how I understood corrective. Uh, now, my mother's memory I can understand why my mother forgot that she was threatening the, the people in the, in the hut, that she's going to send them over to the Germans. It's a radical, quite radical act, and it, there's a lot of rage in, involved. And I mean, she, it was for her, I mean, the, the depression that followed six after the return from the war, I she handled it in a way by, by repressing much of it. For me, the I, it remained a, a vivid memory because as I uh, mentioned in the text, I found that to be on the edge of dysfunctional at that moment. And I had to take over. I had to so I had to be very focused and very much alert, and I functioned as an ego in moments of that kind when she was at the boundaries of not being able to function. Can you imagine yourself, I mean, this is into that position that you are going to turn over 100 Jews to the Einsatzgruppen? And she was ready to do it, because they didn't want to open the door. And they, and they knew that she was ready to do it. And that's how they opened the door. So corrective memory, it's not about accuracy. Although essentially there is a, what's a, the guiding principle is the truth, if you can. Uh, so my, my memory of what happened there was a corrective memory and it was a more true memory. I don't think that as a child I could have made up that she was threatening turning them over to the Germans. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. So the, the truth that's shared and not born alone and therefore more of it can be experienced. Shared Continuing relationship yeah. with your mother. And you, and you can allow in more if it's shared, if you're not the sole bearer. You know, if you we try to imagine 
and do you can everyone can do that experiment a death march but, oh i'm sorry if you try to imagine a death march and there's very little that's been written about or, or documented about the death march but ten, tens of thousands of people perished you imagine it maybe for a few seconds and you turn away from it Try to imagine being in a gas chamber. I think you, it'll, you'll stop that fantasy very quickly. If you talk to, about it to somebody, it, you'll talk longer. It's the presence of the other, of the listener, of the internal companion, that makes it more bearable for, for a longer period of time. In a very simplistic way, I'll say first that the protective spaces in the diet, the reflective space is with the third. Yeah. But that's a, sort of over a summary. It's not. Uh, uh, I can most, uh, the best example would be my own experience. And I think it's a, experience I carried through life that I always feel in a way that there is, there is a protection, that I am loved. And this makes it happen also. It's not, uh, and it really, my, my mother was going to <coughs> do everything, and I knew that including lying to me, and, but a lie that I believed, about the bed, for example. So, if for a child, for a young boy, there is an omnipotence in the parents, and they can make it. I mean, they are the world, they are the intermediary. And so, they, I was placed in between them, mostly at night, but most of the time, and uh, 
uh, already I think there was a highly differentiated language. Uh, I knew what was happening. Um, they knew that I knew about the camps and the experiment. I knew. I, there are many things I do not remember. I think I, witness, I probably witnessed executions, but I only remember here again the question of the protective space and the reflective space. One scene I remember very clearly, but when it's a clear scene, it's probably a um, cover from something else. And the scene is of a man being beaten, 25 uh, fla uh, floggings over his back with uh, others having to stand around and watch it. And I was one of the people watching. I could have walked away, I didn't. And uh, after that everybody left and he was sitting with his blood streaked back and smoking a cigarette. And I very much wanted to ask him what is going on in his mind. Okay, he, I think that both contained the protective space. I didn't identify with this being beaten. I, could, I only imagined that I was safe. I was safe enough to come close to him. And I was safe enough and here's the reflective to, uh, to want to ask him. I didn't dare. And I tried to imagine why does he, what does he feel when he smokes the cigarette? Does it alleviate some of the pain on his back? Interestingly, I became a psychiatrist. <laughs> and probably that was my first psychiatric experience that I tried to imagine with somebody else. Uh, the protective space has its limits. I didn't, I, while we were hiding, we could hear shots. I couldn't imagine the experience of the people who were shot or what was going outside. I could sort of, or I, I could imagine it very briefly and quickly returned. Um, Therefore, I think that uh, when my mother w was distant and it was brutal, it was a big, very big betrayal. I didn't speak to her for 10 years. Speak, uh, we said good morning, but I didn't speak to her, share with her what was going on for 10 years because she had left it, uh, making the world right for me in, with true promises, with false promises, with anything. Um, the reflective space, I think it's also maturity, it's uh, analytic training, it's sort of the exercise of imagining yourself into all kind of other people in all kind of other situations. Uh, it creates a distance from the immediate, from the reliving of the testimony, when you are the interviewer, you share the. There is no telling of testimony. There is a reliving of testimony. And the parameters of time dissolve and uh, place dissolve. So you enter the world and you relive it, and that's how you listen. Uh, difficult to reflect. And. It's therefore, and your first viewing may be at a living, but when you continue viewing it, you can begin to reflect. Therefore, the parapraxis, the not picking up on the difference of the two stories told yesterday, while you are the interviewer, you're so much in it, you, you stop thinking or picking up faucet and the two, two women are sticking it and you don't <coughs> pick it up later on and it takes the continuous, the repeated involvement to allow for the reflective space.
Uh, I think that's my, uh, I'll have a strange reaction, which is that uh, this is a type of presentation where you almost want not to have a reaction. Because by reacting, you are necessarily breaking something that has been taking place. And I would like perhaps to start by remembering uh, or by reminding uh, the, that we are discussing media. And uh, by discussing media, uh, we are in a very interesting situation where this seminar is a medium. This seminar is a medium where a number of things have just happened and continue happening. So, and in this seminar, you have the reference of uh, a story where we see Dori as a child, and then we see him as a mature man, and then we see him now speaking of the child and the mature man, and uh, I believe, and then he's asked questions, and I think that uh, within this process, the question is that we can stop at the interview, and we can stop at the video, and we can stop at any point, but it seems to me that the medium is all of them. And that we have, the, in the same way as you have composite memories, you do have composite media. And that the, this medium, where we are, is essential. And now the second point is very related to the issue of wanting to keep silent, which obviously is paradoxical because I should and I do not. Uh, and uh, is that I believe that what I have heard is not expressing knowledge, even though it is full of references to a number of uh, theories and a number of theorization and a number of formalization. It is expressing something else, which is wisdom. It is like transforming psychoanalytic knowledge or knowledge about testimony into some sort of wisdom. That uh, it seems to me that it is impossible, you know, uh, one of my friends wrote one day, what you are is much more important than what you say. And I believe that there is a certain situation that encompasses everything that has been said. And this situation has to do with your age, with your moment in life, with the fact that your mother is no longer here. With, and I think that um, this situation colors everything you say. And, you know, and I think that I was very attracted to the elegance of your uh, you know, description of a concerto mem of memories. You know, she plays, then I play, then she takes over, then I, I take over. And I think this is quite important and right. But I think there's more than that. And, uh, and it is this sort of uh, wisdom which seems to be essential. Do you want to respond to this? Would I have been able to make this presentation 20 years ago? I think yes, but obviously... Yes. Well, the, the paper was written two years ago, three years ago. And precipitated because I needed to present something and I was asked to do it on a more personal level. <clears throat> I, do, uh, I cannot really answer this question. I mean, about the stage of my wisdom. To me, it's been going back to being a child. I mean, I knew how what was happening at age five, and I even wrote it down later on. But uh, uh, when you left Romania, my mother tore everything up for the fear that the border control would think these are doc secret documents. But I already wrote it down at the age of 10. I do not know what to say about I hope uh, this is not so interesting. You knew what was happening when you okay. were five, and you know now that knowing what was happening when you were five is important, that it does matter. I think that there's all sorts of things that we remember from where we were five, mm -hmm. but we usually don't consider them especially interesting. So the question uh, returns to the issue of truth that we have been discussing. Uh, among those things that have taken place, and the 
among those things that occurred, uh, which are those that matter, and how do they matter? And I believe that uh, uh, through your uh, theorizing, you are able to organize the relevance of a number of things that happen. But it seems to me that besides or beyond this relevance, there's something else. Thank you. question because I'm, I'm not sure whether I have a question. Um, I was extremely moved and impressed uh, especially by the second half of your paper um, which in very sensitive ways describes uh, as I understand it a very thin line between, on the one hand, some kind of um, trust in psychoanalytic um, theory and um, psychoanalytic achievements in, in practice. Oh, no. I didn't do anything. <laughs> Hello? You, you described a very thin line between, on the one hand, some positive, um, maybe I'm too close, yeah, yes. some, some trust in, in, in psychoanalytic theory and its um, practice and in helping um, patients and in making their um, state of affairs somewhat better on the one hand. On the other hand, um, on many places of your paper, it, it comes to the fore the impossibility um, of even to, even partially to heal the wound of the Holocaust, as you at some <coughs> point express it. Um, and it, it, it was so moving because, I mean, as I see it, you describe a, a very resilient woman, your mother, um, and as a consequence, also a very resilient son, as it seems to me. Um, and, and still, the traumatization continues and becomes transferred from your mother towards you, which you also describe in very moving and correct ways as I understand it. Um, um, so I, I, I wonder, and now I try to make a question out of it, I wonder, I mean, you've been working as a psychiatrist for a long time, as I understand it, um, and you must have come across patients who have not been as resilient as your mother and you have been. And um, how, how would you compare the, the, the degree of traumatization, if one at all can talk about degrees, um, with regard to what was and still is, as I understand, going on in your existence and in, in other uh, patients of yours. You know, it's a little difficult to bring in my practice, but I think you, the term resilience is very important. And I here would like also to come back to wisdom. Uh, maybe the difference that Dani picked up was between psychoanalysis and psychotic wisdom. That uh, I'm irritated at symptoms particular symptoms that are from somebody so close and they involve so much my life that my mother is begging for mothering and so forth. <coughs> As an analyst, I've learned 
not to act on my responses, but to keep them and see what comes next. And I think it's the reviewing and re viewing again and viewing again and protecting that reflective space long enough that eventually something can happen in me and I'm no longer angry. I realize that this is a wound that doesn't heal and I can be a companion to the sadness that the wound doesn't heal and the the person wounded does not feel alone. And that's the... And I think when I can do it with my patients, that is quite helpful. And then the healing process may proceed, may uh, go further by, my, by the presence that I provide. So, uh, psychological wisdom is to uh, simply never give up, but to wait long enough and work with, all, sort of keep them and see whether there's another angle, and another angle, and it eventually comes. Sometimes it's very arduous work, and it very, takes a very long time. And because we have resistances and patients want to maintain who they are, you have to wait. That's the, that's the wisdom that in the end, and sometimes you fail, and well, you have to live with that too. Surviving a train wreck. Surviving what? what, what? Surviving. The last one was surviving. Surviving a train accident. Yes. A train accident. Well, any kind of, or a flight uh, crash, any kind of other trauma, is there a yeah. distinct dif difference between Holocaust or any other trauma? I think there's a big difference between uh, man inflicted and uh, accidental trauma. You know, a train accident is a train accident. A kind of trust issues. A kind of trust issues. Trust, you trust issue, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, the, uh, the sense that another human being is doing it to you, sometimes the absence the, of that other human being while he's present that there's absolutely no response to anything that you say, try. Uh, there's no humanity, no humanness. It's very traumatizing, which you cannot quite, you know, in a train accident, the passengers frequently help each other. But would, would you then could com compare Holocaust with, with other uh, trauma like I'm working a great deal with child abuse now, sexual child abuse. And uh, yes, there are, there are commonalities in that the child is absolutely not taken into account. There are differences in that the home is there. And at least uh, there are people who, if they know, they, they could help. I mean, this is a total, <coughs> uh, the deprivation, a total absence of humanity in the Holocaust. I and mean, people uh, don't respond to you as a human being anymore. I, I think rape is a big betrayal because it's somebody that you're close to, often or know, and there's uh, often death threats if you, uh, in rape and, and uh, Molestation too, that if you uh, speak about it, this and this was going to happen to you. 
So it, there is an equivalency. However, there's also a difference that out, there is an other reachable, whether it reached or not, that's a different matter. But then the child speaks up to, the, to somebody who has authority, he can get out of it. In, in the Holocaust, there was no way of getting out, nothing. So there are equivalences. I mean, I, I do very much a similar way of listening and persistence and resilience with uh, child abuse as I do with, with survivors. There is at least an imaginary community. I mean, eternity, next generation, the Jewish people, there's a hope, there's an imaginary community that can be present and uses to find some relief. Uh, we shouldn't forget that what was very important for survivors was to document. And you have uh, vast uh, annals of attempts to, dis to write down what was happening in Poland and Warsaw and the, the tin cans that were found, Ringelblum. That implies that there is another somewhere and these documents will be found and they were found so i think that w was the other but that was the other in the holocaust where the those who will find the documents for whom one wrote so it's, it's a tricky question whether there's an equivalence it's, uh, with the rape and the Holocaust are the same. They have similarities, large similarities, and there are also big differences. The big difference is that in, in the child molestation situation, there is an intact world around. In the Holocaust, the, the, there's no intact world anymore. There may be somewhere, sometimes, somebody who will know. Thank you so much. We will um, close this session with a wisdom that um, that you mentioned in the end, um, that there can be a healing by listening, by co-presence, by not giving up, and by waiting. Mm -hmm.